now fair of all its up. Our nuptial hour draws on a pace. Oh, happy days brings in another moon. But oh, 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 oh methinks how slow. Oh, 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 this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires. Like to a step dame or a dowager law. Oh, oh, oh. With a ring out, a oh, oh, oh. And revenge you. <laughs> Four days will quickly see themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then the shall behold the night of our solemnity. <laughs> Go, Philostrate, stir up the Athenian youth to merriment. Awake the pert and nimble spirit of mirth. Bring melancholy forth to funerals. The pale companion is not for our palm. Hippolyta, I woo thee with my sword, and one thy love doing thee injuries. But I will wed thee in another key. With pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. And no. Theseus, our renowned duke. <clears throat> Thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? Full of vexation come I with complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius. My noble lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander. And my gracious duke, this hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Thou, thou, Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens with my child. Thou hast by moonlight at her window sung with feigning voice verses of feigning love and stolen the impression of her fantasies. With cunning hast thou filched my daughter's heart and turned her obedience, which is due to me, to stubborn harshness. And my gracious duke, be it so, she will not hear before your grace consent to marry with Demetrius. I beg the ancient privilege of Athens. As she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be either to this gentleman here or to her death, according to our law immediately provided in that case. What say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair maid, to you your father should be as a god, one that composed your beauties, yea, and one to whom you are but as a form in wax, by him imprinted, and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. In himself he is. But in this kind, wanting your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. I would my father look, but with my eyes! Rather your eyes must with his judgment look! I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I am made bold, nor how it may concern my modesty in such a presence here to plead my thoughts. But I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case if I refuse to wed Demetrius. Either to die the death or to abjure forever the society of men. Therefore, fair Hermia, question your desires. Know of your youth, examine well your blood. Whether you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun. So will I grow, so live, so die, my lord. Ere I will yield my virgin patent up into his lordship, whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. Take time to pause, and by the next new moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and me, for everlasting bond of fellowship. Upon that day, either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or else to wed Demetrius as he would or on Diana's altar to protest for a austerity and single life. Relent, sweet Hermia, and Lysander, yield thy crazy title to my certain right. You have her father's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermia's. Do you marry him? Scorn for Lysander. True, he hath my love, and what is mine my love may render him, and she is mine, and all my right of her I do estate unto Demetrius. I am, my lord, as well derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his. My fortune's every way as fairly ranked, if not with vantage, as Demetrius. And, which is more than all these boasts can be, I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Why should not I then prosecute my right? Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head, made love to Neter's daughter, Helena, and won her soul. And she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry, upon this spotted and inconstant man. I must confess, I have heard so much, and with Demetrius thought to have spoke thereof, but being over full of self-affairs, my mind did lose it. But Demetrius, come, and come, Aegeus, you shall go with me. I have some private schooling for you both. 
For you, fair Hermia, look you arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields you up, which by no means we can extenuate, either to death or to vow of single life. Whew. Come, Hippolyta. What cheer, my love? Demetrius and Aegeus, go along! I must employ you in some business against our nuptial and confer on you something nearly that concerns yourselves. With duty and desire, we follow you. How now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? Be like for want of rain, which I could well beteem them from the tempest of my eyes. I mean, for aught that I could ever read, could ever hear by Taylor history, the course of true love never did run smooth. If then true lovers have been ever crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Then let us teach our trial patience, because it is a customary cross, as due to love, as in thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears. Poor Fancy's followers. A good persuasion. Therefore, hear me, Hermia. I have a widow aunt, a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no child. From Athens is her house remote seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee. And to that place a sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me, and steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the wood a league without the town, there will I stay for thee. My good Lysander, I swear to thee by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with the golden head, by all the vows that ever men have broke, in number more than ever woman spoke. In that same place thou hast appointed me, tomorrow truly will I meet with thee. Keep promise, love. Look, here comes Helena. Godspeed, fair Helena, with her way. Call you me fair, that fair again unsay. Demetrius loves your fair, oh happy fair. Your eyes are lodestars and your tongue's sweet air more tunable than lark to shepherd's ear. Oh, teach me how you look, and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius' heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. I thought your frowns could teach my smile such skill. I give him curses, yet he gives me love. Oh, that my prayers could such affection move. The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hateth me. Oh, his folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. None but your beauty, but that fault were mine. Take comfort. <laughs> he no more shall see my face. Lysander and myself will fly this place. Before the time I did Lysander see, seemed Athens as a paradise to me. Oh, then what graces in my love do dwell, that he hath turned a heaven unto a hell. Helen, to you our minds we will unfold. Tomorrow night, when Phoebe doth behold her silver visage in the watery glass, decking with liquid pearl the plated grass, a time that lover's flesh doth still conceal, through Athens gates have we devised to steal. And in the wood, where often you and I, upon faint primrose beds, were wont to lie, emptying our bosoms of their counsel sweet, there my Lysander and myself shall meet, and thence from Athens turn away our eyes to seek new friends and stranger companies. Farewell, sweet playfellow. Pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander, we must starve our sight from lover's food till morrow deep midnight. I will, my Hermia. Helen, adieu, as you on him, Demetrius dote on you. Some or other, some can be. Through Athens, I'm thought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all but he do know. And as he errs, doting on her. Love's mine.
will go tell him of their Hermia's flight. Then to the wood will he tomorrow night pursue her for this intelligence. If I have things, it is a dear expense. The script. Here is the scroll of every man's name which is and thought fit in all Athens to play in our interlude before the Duke and Duchess on his wedding day at night. First, good Peter Quince, say what the play treats on, then read the names of the actors and so grow to a point. Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. A very good piece of work, I assure you, and a Mary. Now, good Peter Quince, call forth your actors by the scroll. Masters, uh, spread yourselves. Answer as I call you, uh, Nick Bottom the Weaver. Ready! Name what part I am for and proceed. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? A lover or a tyrant? A lover that kills himself most gallant for love. That will ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I will move storms. I will condole in some measure. To the rest. Francis Flew. Yet my chief humor is for a tyrant. I could play Ercles rarely, or a part to tear a cat in to make all split. The raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates, and Phibus' car shall shine from far and make and mar the foolish fates. Oh, this was lofty. <laughs> now name the rest of the players. Francis Flew. This is Ercles' vein, a tyrant's vein. A lover is more uh, condoling. Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Here, Peter Quince. Flute? You must take Thisbe on you. What is Thisbe? A wandering knight? It is the lady that Pyramus must love. <laughs> Nay, faith, let me not play a woman. I have a beard coming. Oh, but that's all one. You shall play it in a mask, and you may speak as small as you will. And I may hide my face. Let me play Thisbe, too. I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Uh, uh, Thisney, Thisney. Oh, Pyramus, my love. Dear, my Thisbe, dear, and lady, dear. No, no, you must play Pyramus and flute you, Thisbe. Well, proceed. Uh, Robin Starveling, the tailor. Here, Peter Quince. Robin Starveling, you must play Thisbe's mother. <laughs> uh, Tom Snout, the tinker. Here, Peter Quince. You, Pyramus's father, myself, Thisbe's father. Uh, Snug, the joiner. <laughs> you, the lion's part. And I hope here is a play fitted. Oh, have you the lion's part written? Pray you, if it be, uh, give it me, for I am... Slow of study. Oh, you may play the extempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Let me play the lion too. I will roar that I will make. I will roar that I will do any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar that I will make the duke say, "Let him roar again. <laughs> Let him roar again." And you should do it too terribly. You would fright the judges and the ladies that they would shriek, and that were enough to hang us all. That would hang us every mother's son. I grant you, friends, if you should fright the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate my voice so that I will roar you as gently as any sucking dove. I will roar you and twer any nightingale. You can play no part but Pyramus, for Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man as one shall see on a summer's day, a most lovely gentleman-like man. Therefore, you must needs play Pyramus. Well... I will undertake it. Yeah. What beard were I best to play it in? Why, what you will? I will discharge it in either your straw-colored beard, your orange tawny beard, your purple ingrained beard, or your French crown color beard, your perfect yellow. Some of your French crowns have no hair at all, and then you will play barefaced. <laughs> <laughs> but masters, here are your parts, and I am to entreat you, request you, and desire you to con them by tomorrow night, and meet me in the palace wood one mile without the town, by moonlight. There will we rehearse. For if we meet in the city, we will be dogged with company and our devices known. In the meantime, I will draw a bill of property such as our play wants. I pray you, fail me not! We will meet, and there may we rehearse most obscenely and courageously. Take pains, be perfect, adieu. And the Dukes all we meet! 
Hold! Enough! Hold or cut bowstrings! <laughs> Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania! What, jealous Oberon? Fairy skip hence! I have forsworn his bed and company. Terry! Rash wanton! Am not I thy lord? Then I must be thy lady! But I know when thou hast stolen away from Fairyland, and in the shape of corn sat all day playing on pipes of corn, and versing love to amorous Phyllida. Why art thou here, come from the farthest step of India, but that, forsooth, the bouncing Amazon, your buskined mistress, and your warrior love to Theseus must be wedded, and you come to give their bed joy and prosperity. How canst thou thus for shame? Titania glanced my credit with Hippolyta, knowing I know thy love to Theseus. These are the forgeries of jealousy. And never since the middle summer spring met we on hill, in dale, forest, or mead. By paved fountain or by rushy brook, or in the beached margin to the sea to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind. But with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our sport. Therefore the winds, piping to us in vain as in revenge, hath sucked up from the sea contagious fogs, which falling in the land hath every pelting river made so proud that they have overborne their continents. Therefore the moon, the governess of floods, pale in her anger, washes all the air that rheumatic diseases do abound. And thorough this distemperature we see the seasons alter. Hoary-headed frosts fall in the fresh lap of the crimson rose, and on old heme's thin and icy crown, an odorous chaplet of sweet summer buds is as in mockery set. The spring, the summer, the childing autumn, angry winter change their wonted liveries. And the mazed world by their increase now knows not which is which. And this same progeny of evils comes from our debate, from our dissension. We are their parents and original. Do you amend it then? It lies in you. Why should Titania cross her over on? I do but beg a little changeling boy to be my henchman. Set your heart at rest. The fairyland buys not the child of me. His mother was a votress of my order, and in the spiced Indian air by night full often hath she gossiped by my side. But she being mortal of that boy did die, and for her sake do I rear up her boy, and for her sake I will not part with him. How long within these wards intend you stay? Perchance till after Theseus's wedding day. If you will patiently dance in our round and see our moonlight revels, go with us. If not, shun me, and I will spare your haunts. Give me the boy, and I will go with thee. Not for thy fairy kingdom! Fairies away! We shall chide downright if I longer stay. Well, go thy way! Thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for the century. My gentle part come hither! Thou rememberest since once I sat upon a promontory and heard a mermaid on a dolphin's back uttering such dulcet and harmonious breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song and certain stars shot madly from their spheres to hear the sea maid's music. I remember. That very time I saw, but thou couldst not, flying between the cold moon and the earth, Cupid all armed. A certain aim he took at a fair vestal thrown in by the west and loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow as it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts. Yet marked I where the bolt of Cupid fell. It fell upon a little western flower, before milk white, now purple with love's wound, and maidens call it love and idleness. Fetch me this flower, the herb I showed thee once. The juice of it on sleeping eyelids laid will make all man, or woman, madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. Fetch me this herb and looks Thou meet me ere the Leviathan can swim a league. I'll put a girdle round about the earth in forty minutes. Having once this juice, I'll watch Titania. When she's asleep, I will drop the liquor of it in her eyes. The next thing then she waking looks upon, be it a lion, bear, or wolf, or bull, on meddling monkeys or on busy ape, she shall pursue it with a soul of love. And ere I take this charm from off her sight, as I could take it with another herb, 
I'll make her render up her page to me. But who comes here? I am invisible and I will overhear that conference. Ha! I love thee not! Therefore pursue me not! Where is Lysander and fair Hermia? The one I'll slay, the other slayeth me. Thou toldst me they were stolen unto this wood, and now here am I in wood within this wood, for I cannot meet my Hermia. Hence, get thee gone, follow me no more. You draw me, you hard-hearted adamant! Yet you draw not iron, for my heart is true as steel. Leave you your power to draw, and I shall have no power to follow you. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or rather, do I not, in plainest truth, tell you that I do not, nor I cannot, love you? And even for that do I love you the more. Ugh. I am your spaniel, and Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me but as your spaniel. Strike me, spurn me, neglect me, lose me. Only give me leave, unworthy as I am, to follow you. Tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I am sick when I do look on thee. And I am sick when I look not on you. Ugh. You do impeach your modesty too much. To leave the city, and commit yourself into the hands of one who loves you not? To trust the opportunity of night and the ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity? Your virtue is my privilege, for it is not night when I do see your face. Therefore I think I'm not in the night, nor doth this wood lack worlds of company for you, and my respect are all the world. Then how could it be said I am alone when all the world is here to look on me? I'll run from thee, and hide me in the brakes, and leave thee to the mercy of the wild beasts. The wildest hath not such a heart as you! Run when you will, the story shall be changed. A pile of flies and Daphne holds the chase. Uh, oh. <laughs> I will not stay thy questions, let me go. Or if thou follow me, do not believe but I shall do thee mischief in the wood. I in the tumble, the tail, the field, do do me mischief. Fie, Demetrius, your wrongs do set a scandal on my sex. We cannot fight for love as men may do. We should be wooed and we're not made to woo. I'll follow thee, and make a heaven of hell to die upon the hand I love so well. Very well, nymph. Ere he do leave this grove, thou shalt fly him, and he shall seek thy love. Hast thou the flower there? Welcome, wanderer. Aye, there it is. I pray thee, give it me. I know a bank where the wild thyme grows. Where oxlip and the wild grows, <laughs> quite over canopy with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with eglantine. There sleeps Titania some time of the night, lulled in these flowers with dances and in delight. And there the snake throws her enameled skin, weed wide enough to wrap a fairy in. With the juice of this, I'll streak her eyes and make her full of hateful fantasies. Take thou some of it, and seek through this grove. A sweet Athenian lady is in love with the disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes, but do it when the next thing he espies may be the lady. Thou shalt know the Athenian by the garments he hath on. Affect it with some care that he may prove more fond on her than she upon her love. And looks thou meet me ere the first cock. Woo! Fear not, my lord, your servant shall do so! Ow, 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 ow. Come, now a roundel in a fairy song. Then for the third part of a minute hence, some to kill cankers in the musk rose buds, some war with reramice for their leathern wings to make my small elves coats, and some keep back the clamorous owl that nightly hoots and wanders at our quaint spirits. Sing me now asleep, then to your offices and let me rest. You spotted snakes with double tongue, Hogs be not seen, newts and blind worms do no wrong. Come not near our fairy queen. Philomel with melody, sing in our sweet lullaby.
One aloof step, ten to nine. What thou seest when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love's take. Love and languish for his sake. Bid ounce or cat or bear, pard or boar with bristled hair. In thy eye that shall appear, when thou wakest it is thy dear. Wake when some vile thing is near. Oh. Fair love, you faint with wandering in the wood. And to speak troth, I have forgot our way. Well, rest us, Hermia, if you think it good, and tarry for the comfort of the day. Be it so, Lysander. Find you out of bed, for I upon this bank will rest my head. Oh. One turf shall serve as pillow for us both. One heart, one bed, two bosoms, and one troth. Nay, good Lysander, for my sake. My dear, lie further off yet. Do not lie so near. Oh, take the sense, sweet, of my innocence. Then by your side no bedroom me deny for lying so, Hermia. I do not lie. Well, I send her riddles very prettily. Now much beshrew my manners and my pride if Hermia meant to say Lysander lied. But gentle friend, for love and courtesy, lie further off in human modesty. Such separation, as may well be said, becomes a virtuous bachelor and a maid. So far be distant. And good night, sweet friend. Thy love ne'er alter till thy sweet life end. Amen, amen to that fair prayer, say I. And then end life when I end loyalty. Here is my bed. Sleep give thee all his rest. With half that wish, the wisher's eyes be pressed. But Athenian found I none, on whose eyes I might approve this flower's force in stirring love. Night and silence. Who is here? Weeds of Athens he doth wear. <gasps> this is he, my master said, despise the Athenian maid. And here is the maiden, sleeping sound on the dank and dirty ground. Pretty soul. She durst not lie near this lack love, this kill courtesy. Churl, upon thy eyes I throw all the power this charm doth owe. And when thou wakest, let love forbid sleep his seat on thy eyelid. So, awake when I am gone, for I must now to Oberon. Stay, though thou kill me, sweet Demetrius. I charge thee hence. Do not haunt me thus. Wilt thou darkling leave me? Do not so. Stay on thy peril. I alone will go. Oh, I am out of breath in this fond chase. The more my prayer, the lesser is my grace. Happy is Hermia wheresoe'er she lies, for she hath blessed and attractive eyes. How came her eyes so bright? Not with salt tears. If so, my eyes are oftener washed than hers. No, no. I am as ugly as a bear, for beasts that meet me run away for fear. Therefore no marvel, though Demetrius do as a monster, fly my presence thus. But who is here? Lysander on the ground? Dead or asleep? I see no blood, no wound. Lysander, if you live, good sir, awake! And run through fire, I will for thy sweet sake! <laughs> Transparent Helena, nature shows art, that through thy bosom makes me see thy heart. Where is Demetrius? Oh, how fit a word is that vile name to perish on my sword! Do not say so, Lysander, say not so. What though he love your Hermia, Lord, what though? Yet Hermia still loves you, then be content. Content with Hermia? No, I do repent the tedious minutes I with her have spent. Not Hermia, but Helena I love, who will not change a raven for a dove. Wherefore was I to this keen mockery born? When at your hands did I deserve this scorn? Is it not enough? Is it not enough, young man, that I did never, no, nor never can deserve a sweet look from Demetrius' eye, but you must flout my insufficiency? Good truth, you do me wrong, good sooth, you do, in such disdainful manner me to woo, but fare thee well. Perforce, I must confess, I thought you, Lord, of more true gentleness. Oh, that a lady of one man refused should have another therefore be abused! <laughs> she sees not Hermia. Hermia, sleep thou there, and never mayest thou come, Lysander, near. And all my powers address your love and might to honor Helen and to be her knight. 
Help me, Lysander, help me. Do my best to pluck this crawling serpent from my breast. I me. For pity. What a dream was here. Lysander, look how I do quake with fear. Methought a serpent ate my heart away, and you sat smiling at his cruel prey. Lysander? What? Removed? Lysander! Lord! What? Out of hearing? Gone. No sound. No word? Alack, where are you? Speak. And if you hear, speak of all loves. I swoon almost with fear. No. Then I well perceive thou art not nigh. Either death or you I'll find immediately. Uh. Are we all met? <laughs> and here's a marvelous convenient place for our rehearsal. This green plot shall be our stage. This Hawthorne break our tiring house. And we will do it in action as we will do it before the Duke. Peter Quince. What sayest thou, Bully Bottom? There are things in this comedy of Pyramus and Thisbe that will never please. First, Pyramus must draw a sword to kill himself, which the ladies cannot abide. Uh, how answer you that? By a lark and a parlous fear. I believe we must leave the killing out when all is done. Not to wit. I have a device to make all well. Write me a prologue, and let the prologue seem to say we will do no harm with our swords, and that Pyramus is not killed indeed. And for the more better assurance, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, but Bottom the Weaver. This will put them out of fear. Well, we will have such a prologue. Uh -huh. Come sit down, every mother's son, and rehearse your parts. Pyramus, you begin. When you have spoken your speech, enter into that break, and so everyone according to his cue. What hempen homespuns have we swaggering here? So near the cradle of the fairy queen. What? A play torn! I'll be an auditor. And an actor too, perhaps, if I see cause. Speak, Pyramus. This be stand forth. This be the flowers of odious savor odorous. sweet. Odorous! Odorous savor sweet. So hath thy breath, my dearest Thisbe dear. But hark, a voice! Stay thou but here a while, and by and by I will to thee appear. A stranger pyramus than e'er played here. Must I speak now? Mary, must you? For you must understand he goes but to see a noise that he heard and is to come again. Most radiant pyramus! Most lily white of you! I've kind of like the red rose! I'll triumph in Sometime a horse I'll be, sometime a hound, a hog, a headless bear, sometime a fire, and neigh, and bark, and grunt, and roar, and burn, like horse, hound, hog, bear, fire, at every turn. Why do they run away? This is a knavery of them, to make me a fear. Oh, bottom, thou art changed. What do I see on thee? What do you see? You see an ass head of your own, do you? Bless thee, bottom, bless thee. Thou art... Translated! <laughs> I see their knavery. This is to make an ass of me, to fright me if they could. But I will not stir from this place. Do what they can. I will walk up and down here and I will sing that they shall hear I am not afraid. The owls will talk so black of you with orange tawny bill. The 
throstle with his nose so true, the wren with little quill. Oh, what angel wakes me from my flowery bed? The finch, the sparrow, and the lark, the plain song cuckoo gray, whose note full many a man doth bark and dares not answer nay. Oh, for indeed, who would set his wit to so foolish a bird? Uh, uh, who would give a bird the lie, though he cry cuckoo? Never so. I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamored of thy note. So is mine eye enthralling to thy shape. And thy fair virtue's force perforce doth move me on the first view to say, to swear. I love thee! Oh, <laughs> Methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that. And yet, to say the truth, reason and love keep little company together nowadays, uh, the more the pity that some honest neighbors will not make them friends. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Nay, I can gleek upon occasion. Thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Not so, neither. But if I had wit enough to get out of this wood, I have enough to serve mine own turn. Out of this wood do not desire to go. Thou shalt remain here whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common rage. The summer still doth tend upon my state. And I do love thee. I wonder if Titania be awaked. Then what it was which next came in her eye, which she must dote on in extremity. How now, mad spirit? What night rule now about this haunted grove? My mistress, with a monster, is in love! <laughs> Near to her close and consecrated bower, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour, a crew of patches, rude mechanicals that work for bread upon Athenian stalls, were met together to rehearse a play, intended for great Theseus' nuptial day. The shallowest, thick skinned of that barren sort, who Peer mispresented in their sport, forsook his scene and entered in a break. When I did him at this advantage take, an ass's knoll, I fix it on his head. <laughs> Anon, his thisbe must be answered, and forth my mimic comes. When they him spy, away his fellows fly. I led them on this distracted fear, and left sweet Pyramus translated there. So in that moment it came to pass. Titania waked and straightway loved an ass. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> this falls out better than I could devise. <laughs> but hast thou yet latched the Athenian with the love juice as I did bid thee do? <laughs> I took him sleeping. That is finished too. And the Athenian woman by his side, that when he waked of force, whoop, she must be eyed. Stand aside. This is the same Athenian. This is the woman. But not this the man. Why rebuke you him that loves you so? Lay breath so bitter on your bitter foe. Now I but chide, but I should use thee worse. For thou, I fear, oh. hast given me cause to curse. If thou hast slain, lie center in his sleep. Being o'er shoes and blood, plunge in the deep. And kill me too. The sun was not so true unto the day. And so should I, pierced through the heart with your stern cruelty. Yet you, the murderer, look as bright, as clear as yonder Venus in her glimmering sphere. Oh, what's this to my Lysander? Where is he? Ah, oh, good Demetrius, wilt thou give him me? I would rather give his carcass to my hounds. Out, dog! Out, cur! Thou drewst me past the bounds of maiden's patience. Hast thou slain him then? Henceforth be never numbered among men. You spend your passion on a misprized mood. I am not guilty of Lysander's blood, nor is he dead, for aught that I can tell. I pray thee, tell me then that he is well. And if I could, what should I get there for? A privilege. Never to see me more, and from thy hated presence part I so. See me no more, whether he be dead or no. There is no following her in this fierce vein. Here, therefore, for a while I will remain. Oh, so sorrow's heaviness doth heavier grow. 
For death that bankrupt sleep doth sorrow owe, which now in some slight measure it will pay, if for his tender here I make some stay. What hast thou done? Thou hast mistaken quite and laid the love juice on some true love sight. Of thy misprison must perforce ensue some true love turned and not a false turn true. About the wood go swifter than the wind, and Helen of Athens look thou find. O oh, fancy six years with pale of cheer, with sighs of love that cost the fresh blood dear. By some illusion cease thou bring her here, I'll charm his eyes again, she do appear. I go! I go. Look how I go. Swifter than arrow from the Tartar's bow. Flower of this purple dye, hit with Cupid's archery. Sink an apple of his eye, what is love he doth despise? Let her shine as gloriously as the Venus of the night. When thou wakest, if she be Shall I compare thine eyne? Crystal is muddy. Oh, how ripen show thy lips, those kissing cherries tempting grow. That pure congealed white, high taurus of snow, fanned with the eastern wind, turns to a crow, and thou holdst up thy hand. Oh, let me kiss this princess of pure white, the seal of bliss. Oh, sprite, oh, hell, I see you all are bent to set against me. For you may remain if you were civil and you heard. Demetrius, be not so, for you love Hermia, this you know I know. And with all good will, with all my heart, in Hermia's love I yield you up my part. And yours of Helen to me bequeath, whom I do love and will do till my death. Never did mockers waste more idle breath. Lysander, keep thy Hermia, I will none. If e'er I loved her, all that love is gone. My heart to her but is guestwise sojourned. Now to Helen is at home returned, there to remain. Helen, it is not so. Disparage not the faith thou dost not know, lest to thy peril thou abide dear. Look, where thy love comes, yonder is thy dear. Dark night, that from the eye his function takes, the ear more quick of apprehension makes, wherein it doth impair the seeing sense. It pays the hearing double recompense. Oh, thou art now by mine eye, Lysander found. Mine ear, I think, it brought me to thy sound. But why unkindly didst thou leave me so? Why should he stay whom love doth press to go? What love could press Lysander from my side? Lysander's love that would not let him bide. 
Fair Helen, who more in glice and night than all yon fiery O's and eyes of light, why seek'st thou me? Could not this make thee know the hate I bear thee made me leave thee so? You speak not as you think, it cannot be. Lo, she is one of this confederacy! Now I perceive they have conjoined all three to fashion this false sport in spite of me! Injurious Hermia, most ungrateful maid, have you conspired? Have you with these contrived to bait me with this foul derision? Is all the counsel we two have shared, the sisters' vows, the hours that we have spent when we have chid the hasty-footed time for parting us? Oh, is all for God? I am amazed at your passionate words. I scorn you not. It seems you scorn me. Have you not said Lysander, as in scorn, to follow me and praise my eyes and face, and made your other love Demetrius, who even but now did spurn me with his foot to call me goddess, nymph, divine, rare, precious, celestial? Wherefore speaks he this to her he hates? And wherefore doth Lysander deny your love so rich within his soul, and tender me forsooth affection, but by your setting on, by your consent? What though I be not so in grace as you, so hung upon with love, so fortunate, but miserable most, to love unloved, this you should pity rather than despise. I understand not what you mean by this. I do, persever! Counterfeit sad looks, thick mouths upon me when I turn my back, wink at each other, hold this sweet jest up. If you had any pity, grace, or manners, you would not make me such an argument. But fare thee well, tis partly my own fault, which death or absence soon shall remedy. Stay, gentle Helena. Hear my excuse, my love, my life, my soul, fair Helena. Oh, excellent! Sweet, do not scorn her so. If she cannot entreat, I can compel. Who can't compel no more than she entreats? Thy threats have no more strength than her weak prayers. Helen, I love thee. By my life I do. I swear by that which I will lose for thee, to prove him false that says I love thee not. I say I love thee more than he can do. If thou say so, withdraw and prove it too. Quick, come! Lysander, where to tends all this? Away with you! Uh, you uh, oh. <laughs> no, no, he'll seem to break loose, take on as you would follow, but yet come not. You are a tame man. Go! Hang off, thou cat, thou burr! Thou thing let loose, or I will shake thee for me like a serpent! Why are you grown so rude? What change is this sweet love? Thy love? Oh. Thou loathe medicine, oh hidden potion, hence! Oh. Do you not jest? Yes, sooth, and so do you! Demetrius, I will keep my word with thee. I would I had your bond, for I perceive a weak bond holds you. I'll not trust your word. What, should I hurt her, strike her, kill her dead? Although I hate her, I'll not harm her so. Hate me? What could you do me greater harm than hate? Hate me? Oh me, what news is this, my love? And not I, Hermia. Are not you, Lysander? I'm as fair now as I was erewhile. Since night you loved me. Yet since night you left me, why then you left me, oh, the gods forbid, in earnest, shall I say. Ay, by my life, and never did desire to see thee more. Therefore be out of hope, of question, of doubt. Be certain, nothing truer. Tis no jest that I do hate thee. I love Helena. Oh, me, you juggler, you canker blossom. You thief of love! What, have you come by night and stolen my love's heart from him? Fine it, faith! Have you no modesty, no maiden shame, no touch of bashfulness? What, will you tear impatient answers from my gentle tongue? Fie, fie, you counterfeit, you puppet, you! Puppet? Why so? Aye, that way goes the game. Now I perceive she hath made compare between our statures. She hath urged her height. And with her personage, her tall personage, her height, forsooth, she hath prevailed with him. And are you grown so high in his esteem because I am so dwarfish and so low? How low am I, thou painted maple? <gasps> Speak, how low am I? I am not yet so low but that my nails can reach unto thine eye. <laughs> I pray you, though you mock me, gentlemen, let her not hurt me. I was never cursed. I have no gift at all of shrewishness. I am a right maid in my cowardice. Let her not strike me. You perhaps may think because she is something lower than myself that I can match her. Lower? Now, so you'll let me quiet. 
might go to Athens while I bear my folly back and follow you no more. Let me go. You see how simple and how fond I am. Why get you gone? Who is that hinders you? A foolish heart that I leave here behind. What with Lysander? Like Demetrius! You're not afraid. She shall not harm thee, Helena. No, sir, she shall not, but you take her part. Oh, when she is angry, she is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when we went to school. Now she'd be but little. She is fierce. Little, again. Nothing but low and little. Why will you suffer her to flout me thus? Let me come to her. Oh! Oh! Get oh. you gone, you storm! Ah. You minimus of hindering, not grass maid! Oh. Lysander! You ain't gone! You are too officious in her behalf that scorns your services. Let her alone. Speak not of Helena, take not her part. For if thou dost intend never so little show of love to her, thou shalt abide it. Now she holds me not. Now follow if thou darest to try whose right of thine or mine is most in Helena. Follow? Nay, I'll go with thee. Cheek, bite, jowl. You, mistress, all this coil is long of you. Nay, go not back. I will not trust you, I, nor longer stay in your cursed company. Your hands and mine are quicker for a fray. My legs are longer though to run away. <laughs> I am amazed and know not what to say. This is thy negligence. Oh. Still thou mistakes or else commits thy neighbories willfully. Oh, oh. Believe me, King of Shadows, I mistook. Did not you tell me that I should know the man by the Athenian garments he had on? Thou seest these lovers seek a place to fight. I therefore, Robin, overcast the knight and lead these testy rivals so astray as one come not within another's way. Like to Lysander sometimes frame thy tongue, then stir Demetrius up with bitter wrong, and sometimes rail thou like Demetrius, till o'er their brow death counterfeiting sleep, with leaden legs and batty wings doth creep. Then crush this herb into Lysander's eye. When they next wake, all this derision shall seem a dream and fruitless vision, and back to Athens shall the lovers wend, with league whose date till death shall never end. Well, as I in this affair do thee employ, I'll to my queen and beg her Indian boy. And then I will her charmed eyes release from monster's view, and all things will be peace. We may affect this business yet ere day. Up and down, up and down. I will lead them up and down. I am feared in field and town. Goblin lead them up and down. Ah, here comes one. Where art thou, proud Demetrius? Speak thou now. Aha! Here, villain, drawn and ready. Where art thou? I will be with thee straight. Follow me then to plainer ground. Lysander! Speak again! Thou runaway! Thou coward! Art thou fled? Speak! In some bush! Where dost thou hide thy head? Coward! Art thou bragging to the stars? Telling the bushes that thou looked for war and wilt not come? Come, recreant, come now, child. I'll whip thee with the rod. He is defiled that draws a sword on thee. Yea, art thou there? Oh, follow my voice. We'll try no manhood here. He goes before me, and he still dares me on. I come to where he calls, and then he is gone. Oh, the village is much lighter healed than I. Oh, he followed fast, but faster did he fly. And fallen am I in dark and even way. He will rest me. Come thou gentle day, for if but once thou show me thy great light, I'll find Demetrius and revenge this spite. Ho, 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 coward, why comes thou not? Abide me if thou darest, for well I wot thou runst before me, shifting every place, and darest not stand nor look me in the face. Where art thou now? Come hither. Oh, I am here! Nay, thou mockst me. Oh, thou shalt buy this dear if ever I thy face by daylight see. Now go thy way. Faintness constraineth me to measure out my length on this cold bed. Thy day's approach look to be visited. O oh, weary night, O oh, long and hideous night, abate thy hours. Shine comforts from the east, that I may back to Athens by daylight from these my poor company detest. And sleep that sometimes shuts up sorrow's eye. Steal me a while from mine own company. Yet but three. Come one more. Two of both kinds make up four. Ah, here she comes, cursed and sad. 
Cupid is a knavish lad, thus to make poor females mad. Oh, never so weary, never so in woe, be dabbled with the dew and torn with friars. Oh, I can no further crawl, no further go. My legs can keep no pace with my desires. Here will I rest me till the break of day. Heavens, shield Lysander if they mean affray. <sighs> On the ground, sleep sound. I'll apply to your eye, gentle lover. Remedy. When thou wakest, thou takest true delight in the sight of thy former lady's eye. And the country proverb known, that every man shall have his own, in your waking shall be shown. Jack shall have Jill, not shall go ill. The man shall have his mare again. And all shall be well! Sound, music, come my queen, take hands with me, and rock the ground whereon these sleepers be. and blessed to theirs fair prosperity. There shall the pairs of faithful lovers be, wedded with Theseus and all in charge. of the day, my love shall hear the music of my hounds. Uncouple in the western valley, let them go. Dispatch, I say, and find the forester. We will, fair queen, up to the mountain's top and mark the musical confusion of hounds and echo in conjunction. <laughs> I was with Hercules at Cadmus once, when in a wood of Crete they bade the bear with hounds of Sparta. Never had I heard such gallant chiding for, besides the groves, the skies, the fountains, Every region near seemed all one mutual cry. I never heard so musical a discourse, such sweet thunder. My hounds are bred of the Spartan kind, so flued, so sanded, and their heads are hung with ears that sweep away the morning dew. Crook kneed and dew lapped like Vassilian bulls, slow in pursuit, but matched with mouths like bells, each under each a cry more tunable. Was never hauled to nor cheered with horns in Crete, in Sparta, nor in Thessaly. Judge when you hear. What nymphs are these? My lord, this is my daughter here asleep. And this Lysander. 
this Demetrius is, and this Helena, old Nader's Helena. I wonder if they're being here together. No doubt! They rose up early to observe the rite of May, and hearing our intent came in grace of our solemnity. <laughs> but speak, Aegeus, is this not the day that Hermia should give answer for her choice? It is, my lord. Go bid the huntsmen wake them with their horns. Good morrow, friends! St. Valentine is past! Begin these woodbirds but to couple now? Pardon, my lord. I pray you all stand up. I know you two are rival enemies. How comes this gentle concord in the world? My lord, I shall reply amazedly. Half sleep, half waking. But as yet I... But as yet I truly cannot say how I came here. But as I think, for truly what I speak, and how I do bethink me so it is, I came with Hermia hither. Our intent was to be gone from Athens, where we might, without the peril of the Athenian law... Enough! Be... Enough, my lord, you have enough! I beg the law, the law upon his head! They would have stolen away. They would, therefore, Demetrius, to have defeated you and me. You of your wife and me of my consent. My consent that she should be your wife! My lord, fair Helen told me of their stealth, of this their purpose hither to this wood, and I, in fury, hither followed them, Fair Helena in fancy following me, but my lord, I wot not by what power, but by some power it is. My love for Hermia melted as the snow. It seems to me now is the remembrance of an idle god which in my childhood I did dote upon. And every faith, all the virtue of my heart, the object and passion of mine eye is only Helena. To her, my lord, was I betrothed ere I saw Hermia. But like a sickness I did loathe this food, but as in health come to my natural taste. And now I do wish it. Love it, long for it, and will forevermore be true to it. Fair lovers, you are fortunately met. Of this discourse we more will hear anon. Aegeus, I will overbear your will. For in the temple, by and by with us, these couples shall eternally be knit. <laughs> and for the morning now is something worn, our proposed hunting shall be set aside. Away with us, to Athens, three and three. <laughs> we'll hold a feast in great solemnity. Come, Hippolyta. <laughs> Tis strange, my Theseus, that with which these lovers speak of. More strange than true. I never may believe these antique fables nor these fairy toys. <laughs> lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. <laughs> the lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination, all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold. That is the madman. The lover, all as frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye, in fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies forth, the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shape and gives to airy nothing, a local habitation and a name. Such tricks hath strong imagination, that if it would but apprehend some joy, it comprehends the bringer of that joy. Or, in the night, imagining some fear, how easy a bush supposed to bear. But all the story of the night told over, and all their minds transfigured so together, were witnesses than fancy's images and grows to something of great constancy, howsoever strange and admirable. <laughs> Here come the lovers full of joy and mirth. Joy, gentle friends, joy and fresh days of love accompany your hearts. More than to us, wait in your royal walks, your board, your bed. <laughs> <laughs> come now, what masks, what dances shall we have? How shall we wear away the long age of three hours between our after supper and bedtime? <laughs> Where is our usual manager of mirth? Are there no revels in hand? Is there not a play to ease the anguish of a torturing hour? Call a fellow straight! Here, <laughs> mighty Theseus. <laughs> Say, what abridgments have you for this evening? What masks, what music? How shall we beguile the lazy time if not with some delight? There is a brief. How many sports are ripe? Make choice of which your highness will see first. <laughs> The Battle of the Centaurs to be sung by an Athenian uh, eunuch to the harp. I'll have none of that. That have I told my love and glory of my kinsman Hercules. <laughs> the riot of the tipsy Bacchnos tearing the Thracian singer in their rage. <laughs> that is an old device, and it was played when I from Thebes came last to conqueror. <laughs> 
Ooh, the thrice three muses mourning for the death of learning. Late deceased in beggary. That is some satire, keen and critical. Not sorting for a nuptial ceremony. <laughs> oh. A tedious and brief scene of young Pyramus and his love, Thisbe. <laughs> Very tragical mirth. Merry and tragical, tedious and brief. Why, that is hot ice and wondrous strange snow. <clears throat> How shall we find a concord for this discord? A play there is, my lord, some ten words long, which is as brief as I have known a play. <laughs> But by ten words, my lord, it is too long, which makes it tedious. For in all the play, there is not one word apt, one player fitted. And tragical, my noble lord, it is. For Pyramus therein doth kill himself. Which, when I saw rehearsed, I must confess, made mine eyes water. But more merry tears, the passion of loud laughter, and never shed. And what are shed. they that do play it? Hard-handed men that work in Athens here, which never labored in their minds till now, and, and now have toiled their unbreathed memories in the same play against your nuptial. And we will hear it! No, my noble lord, it is not for you! I have, I have heard it over, and it is nothing, nothing in the world, unless you can find sport in their intents, extremely stretched and conned with cruel pain <laughs> to do you service. I will hear that play, for never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. Bring them forth, and take your places, ladies. I love not to hear wretchedness or charge, and duty in its service perishing. Why, gentle Swede, you shall hear no such thing. She says they can do nothing of this kind. The kind are we to give them thanks for nothing. Our sport shall be to take what they mistake. What poor duty cannot do, noble respect takes in might, not merit. <laughs> So please, your grace, the prologue is addressed. Let them approach! If we offend, it is with our goodwill. <laughs> you should think we come not to offend, but with goodwill, to show our simple skill. That is the true beginning of our end. <laughs> Consider then we come but in despite. We do not come as minding to content you. Our true intent is, oh, for your delight, we are not here. <laughs> that you should here repent you, the actors are at hand. And by their show, you shall know all that you are like to know. This fellow doth not speak upon points. He hath rid his prologue like a rough colt. He knows not to stop. A good moral, my lord, it is not enough to speak, but to speak true. Indeed, he hath played upon this prologue like a child on a recorder. A sound, but not in government. His speech was like a tangled chain, nothing impaired, but all disordered. Who is next? Gentles! <laughs> Perchance you wonder at this show, but wonder on shall truth make all things plain. This man is Pyramus, if you will know. This beauteous lady Thisbe is certain. This man with lime and rough cast doth present wall, that bio wall which did these lovers sunder, and through walls chained poor souls they were content to whisper, at the which let no man wonder. This man with lantern, dog, and bush of thorn present moonshine. For if you will know, by moonshine did these lovers think no scorn to meet at Nina's tomb, there, there to woo. This grisly beast which lie in height by name, the trusty Disney coming first by night, did scare away, or rather did affright. And as she fled her mantle she did fall, and lie in vile with bloody mouth did stain. <gasps> Anon comes Pyramus, sweet youth and tall, and finds his trusty Tisby's mantle slain. Whereat with blade, with bloody blameful blade, he bravely broached his boiling bloody breast, and Thisbe, tearing in mulberry shade, his dagger drew and died. And for all the rest, let lion moonshine wall and lovers twain at large discourse while here they do remain. I wonder if the lion be to speak. Oh, no wonder, my lord, one lion may when many asses do. <laughs> <laughs> in this same interlude it doth befall that I once snout by name present a wall and such a wall as I would have you think added in a cranny to hold a chink to which the love of Pyramus and Thisbe did whisper often very secretly this loam, this rough cast, this stone doth show I am that same wall the truth is so here the cranny is right and sinister to which the fearful love is out to whisper. Would you desire lime and hair to speak better? It is the wittiest <laughs> partition that ever I heard discourse, my lord. <laughs> <laughs> Silence, Pyramus draws near the wall. O oh, grim-looked night, O oh, night with hue so black, O oh, night whichever art when day is not, O oh, night, O oh, night, alack, 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 I fear me Thisbe's promise is forgot. And wall, O oh, wall, O oh, sweet, O oh, lovely wall, that stands between her father's ground and mine, Wall, O oh wall, O oh sweet and lovely wall, show me thy chink to blink through with mine eye. <laughs> Thanks, courteous wall. Jove shield thee well for this. But what see I? 
No Thisbe do I see! O oh, wicked wall through whom I see no bliss! Cursed be thy stones for thus deceiving me! The wall, methinks, being sensible, should curse again! No, indeed she should not. Deceiving me is Thisbe's cue. She is to enter now, and I am to spy her through the wall. You will see, it will all fall past as I told you. Yonder, she comes! Uh. Oh! <laughs> I see a voice. Now will I to the chink to spy that I can hear my Thisbe's face. Thisbe! My lord, is my Think what thou wilt. I am thy lover's grace, and like Lamander am I trusty still. And now I have until the fates we kill. Not shuffleest of progress was so true. Not of progress are to you. Oh, kiss me through the whole of this vile wall. <laughs> <laughs> I kiss the Lord's room, not your lips at all. Wilt thou in Nini's tomb meet me straightway? Take it! Take it! I can't go down to the air! <laughs> Thus have I, wall, my pot discharged so. And being done, thus wall away doth go. Now is the wall down between the two neighbors. No remedy, my lord, when walls are so willful to hear without warning. This is the silliest stuff that ever I heard. <laughs> the best in this kind are but shadows, and the worst are no worse if imagination amend them. Then it must be your imagination, then, and not theirs. If we imagine no worse of them than they of themselves, they may pass for excellent men. <laughs> <laughs> this is all in these two! Well roared lion! Well run, Thisbe! Well shown, moon, truly the moon shines with a good grace. <laughs> well mouthed, lion. <laughs> and on comes Pyramus. And so the lion vanished. Sweet moon, I thank thee for thy sunny beams. I thank thee, moon, for shining now so bright. For by thy gracious golden glittering gleams, I trust to take of truest Thisbe's sight. But stay, O oh Spike, but mark, poor knight, what dreadful dole is here? <laughs> Eyes, do you see? How can it be? O oh, dainty duck! Oh dear. <laughs> Thy mantle good. What? Stained with blood? Approach ye furies fell! Oh fates, come, come, cut thread and thrum! This passion and the death of a dear friend would go near to make a man look sad. Be shrew my heart, but I pity the man. Wherefore, nature, didst thou lions frame, since lion vile hath here deflowered to my ear? <laughs> which is, no, no, which was the fairest dame that lived, that loved, that liked, that looked with cheer? Come, tears confound. Out sword! <laughs> Out sword! Oh. <laughs> I... <laughs> Out sword and wound that pap of Pyramus. I that left pap. Where heart doth hop. <laughs> thus die I! Thus, thus, thus! <laughs> now am I dead! Now am I fled! My soul is in the sky! Tongue, lose thy light! Moon, take thy flight! <laughs> now, die! With the help of a surgeon, he 
can't recover and prove an ass. How chance Moonshine is gone before Thisbe comes back to find her lover? Here she comes and her passion ends the play. You think she should not use a long one for such a pyramus? I hope she will be brief. She has spied him already with those sweet eyes. And thus she means vitalicit. <laughs> Asleep, my love? Ow. What? <laughs> Damn my dog! Oh, the others arise! Speak, speak! Quite dumb. Dead, dead! A child must cover my sweet eyes! These lips! <laughs> this cherry nose! <laughs> your burgomask, oh. let your epilogue alone. Twelve lovers to bed, tis almost fairy time. I fear we shall outsleep the coming morn. As much as we this night have overwatched this palpable gross play, hath well beguiled the heavy gates of night. But sweet friends to bed, a fortnight hold we this solemnity in nightly revels and new jollity. The hungry lion roars and the wolf behowls the moon. Whilst the heavy plowman snores, all with weary task for done. Now the wasted brands do glow, whilst the screech owl screeching loud puts the wretch that lies in woe in remembrance of a shroud. Now it is.
shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear, and this weak and idle theme, no more yielding but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend, if you pardon we will mend, and as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck now to escape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long, else the puck a liar call. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands, if we be friends, and the robin shall restore a man!